technology problem solved. Uh, so go ahead, the state may present its opening statement. It was a cold and windy Sunday afternoon in November. Thousands of people were bundling up and going downtown to watch the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade. The event started off normal. There were dance teams, high school marching bands, local community groups, local businesses, all making their way down the parade route. The streets were lined with friends and family members and neighbors, people there to soak up the atmosphere. Kids ran into the street to grab candy from the people who were throwing it from the parades. It sounds corny, but I think you'll see from the videos, there was a true sense of joy in the air. Daryl Brooks killed that joy. He replaced it with terror, trauma, and death. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Brooks left behind a trail of carnage and chaos as he made his way down Main Street through the parade route. The evidence will show that he left that crime scene, created that crime scene, in fact, because he was fleeing from another one. One where he had laid his hands on a woman and where police involvement became inevitable. So as he careened down Main Street, swerving from curb to curb, hands glued to the steering wheel, eyes fixed on the road in front of him with a silent rage on his face, he hit the gas with his red Ford Escape and used it as a battering ram over and over again, striking men, women, and kids. In the end, Mr. Brooks killed six people. He injured dozens more and left a permanent scar on this community. We are going to present evidence to you over the next several days in chronological phases, in order of events, from start to end. I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm going to lay out for you the table of contents of this story. We're going to set the scene with Sergeant Dave Warner from the city of Waukesha Police Department. Sergeant Warner was the highest ranking police official working at the parade that day. He was the incident commander for the Waukesha Christmas Parade, and we are going to, with Sergeant Warner's help, take you through this, which is the first of three maps that we will refer to repeatedly throughout this trial. This map depicts the area that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days, the parade route. Now, for those of you not entirely familiar with downtown Waukesha, this is going to look like a bunch of gibberish, but once we get going and we repeatedly refer to these street names and the business names and the groups that were involved in this parade, I think it'll become like a second language to you. Sergeant Warner will describe for you how the, the parade route ran uh, from, if you look closely at the screens in front of you, the intersection of Main Street and White Rock Avenue. White Rock was a staging area for the parade groups and floats. And they made their way southeast on White Rock until they came to Main Street, and then they would make a right turn and head southeast down Main Street through the parade route until the very end as it wraps around to the south and runs into Wisconsin Avenue. The parade route then would continue to the east, making a left-hand turn on Wisconsin, but nothing really happens on Wisconsin Avenue. You're not going to hear any testimony about that. As you can see from this map, it depicts or represents uh, each intersection where a squad car or a police officer was stationed. They're denoted by the little badge shields uh, in the intersections. If you look closely, you can see little red lines, and Sergeant Warner will describe how those represent the barricades that were placed at each intersection for security and safety purposes. Once we've got that established, we're going to move into the first chapter of this story, and you're going to hear about the origin of Mr. Brooks's rage that day. A violent domestic argument with Erica Patterson his former girlfriend and the mother of his child. Erica Patterson is going to testify, either today or tomorrow, hopefully today. She's going to tell you that in November of 2021, she was staying at the Women's Center, which is a shelter here in Waukesha. And on the day in question, November 21st of 2021, 
the defendant showed up in Waukesha in his red Ford Escape that she knew he drove, and he argued with her, and he harassed her, and he punched her in the face. And the thing about a swollen eye is it's tough to fake. You're going to hear evidence about how after, uh, well, let me back up. You're going to hear evidence about how the defendant took Erica Patterson all over town that afternoon, from Frame Park, across the river, up Barstow Hill, back down to Frame Park. And at some point after she was struck, after she sustained that injury, Erica called her friends because she needed help. And she had no one else to call. One of those friends is Corey Runkle. You're going to hear from Corey on the witness stand in this trial. Corey's going to say that she was Erica's roommate at the Women's Center. She had known Erica for a few weeks and they had grown close. And when she got the call from Erica that Erica needed help, Corey immediately responded to help. And she ended up finding Erica and Daryl Brooks in front of the White Rock School. If we go back, the White Rock School is on White Rock Avenue. It's on near the top right portion of the map. It's just south of Frame Park. And Corey is going to talk about how she, she found Erica and the defendant at this, at this location, and she got into both a physical and a verbal altercation with Mr. Brooks. That altercation is captured on surveillance video, two surveillance videos, actually. You're going to see both of them. You're going to see how the defendant was reacting that day. You're going to see what he looked like, what he was wearing, the red Ford Escape that he was driving. You're going to see how the defendant reacted once Erica's friends showed up and he lost his physical advantage over a woman. Erica and Corey will also testify that at some point during this scuffle, the police were called. And you're going to see a separate video, a squad video, from the responding officer that shows just down the block there was a marked squad car with its lights flashing, marking the entrance to the parade, something that people in front of White Rock School would have seen. So the evidence is going to show that the defendant must have known once things got loud and once there was more than just him and Erica on scene, the police were going to show up. So he took the coward's way out. You're going to see him in the video get into the driver's seat of that red SUV. Corey and Erica will tell you that no one else was in the car. And you're going to see him pull off on White Rock towards Main Street. You're going to hear from law enforcement officers who were positioned along the parade route. The officers who made their initial contact with the defendant, the first ones who tried to stop him. And the first one is Detective Tom Casey, the lead detective in this case. He's sitting at the state's prosecution table right behind me. He's going to tell you that he was working that day as security for the parade. He was working at Maine and White Rock. He's the first law enforcement officer to come into contact with the defendant during this incident, face-to-face, -face, or I would, I think, better describe it as face-to-windshield. He tried to stop the defendant, but there's only so much a man can do against an SUV. But he's going to tell you that he got so close, he got such a good look at Daryl Brooks's face that from that witness stand, he'll be able to say to you definitive, definitively, Daryl Brooks, the man in orange on the video screen, is the man who was driving the red SUV in this case. You're going to hear from a few more officers. Uh, Officer Bryce Butcher and Officer Sonia Schneider. They were positioned at the intersection of Main Street and East Avenue just a little bit further southwest uh, in that map. You're going to hear them describe how they saw this red SUV approaching. They quickly realized it was not part of the parade. They quickly realized this was a problem. There are people, children, in the street, lining the street. And so they jumped into action. They tried to stop it. As the, barrel, as the SUV started barreling towards them, Officer Butcherin, again, tried to get in the way. He put himself at risk trying to get in front of the vehicle. Couldn't stop it. Officer Schneider tried to redirect the vehicle up Buckley Street, making a right-hand turn. She'll tell you, and you'll see in the video, there was room. There was space. She couldn't do it. The defendant blew past her. 
and that's when the screams in the police radio start. You're going to hear from Jim Hawkinson, the battalion chief for the Waukesha Fire Department. He's going to tell you about the massive scope of the emergency response to this tragedy. He was in charge of the fire department that day. He's going to tell you about all of the units that had to respond to the scene. The massive amount of resources needed to triage and treat and transport all the victims. He's going to tell you about the response from other communities in southeast Wisconsin, the mutual aid call that went out, and all the other communities that came to help out. He's going to tell you about how Waukesha Memorial Hospital, just up the hill from the parade route, quickly reached capacity. And so everybody had to be diverted to other medical facilities. We'll transition then into the next chapter of this story, and you're going to hear from some of the people whose lives were forever changed by the defendant's terrible decisions that day. But I'll tell you right now, you're not going to hear from all of them. It wouldn't make sense. It's not necessary. We intend to present the evidence to you in an efficient and streamlined way we will elicit testimony and introduce exhibits that cover every element of every single criminal charge in this case. But our goal is to avoid duplication of evidence and to avoid undue hardship on the victims and the witnesses who have already suffered so much. So the first witness in this part of the trial that you're going to hear from is Nicole White. She's the very first person, aside from Detective Casey, who was struck by the defendant on that day. She's going to tell you, as we look at this second of the three maps that we're going to repeatedly refer to, that she was marching with her co-workers and friends with uh, Remax. You'll recognize the float, I think, in the videos, because just like the commercials for Remax, there's a giant hot air balloon that shoots fire out of the basket, which is pretty cool. And she's going to tell you, she was watch, mar marching with her friends and her co-workers when, without any warning, she was hit from behind and knocked over. You're going to see video of that. Nicole White has a, a special significance in this case because, as the first person who was struck, she represents the point in time when Mr. Brooks was legally required to stop. You heard the judge read the, the hit-and-run jury instructions and to summarize, in Wisconsin, anybody who's operating a motor vehicle who's involved in some kind of accident, they have a duty to stop, to investigate, to exchange information. Not only did Daryl Brooks not stop, the evidence will show that he sped up. The evidence will show that as his body count increased, so did his motive to get away. Nicole White, I think, is a good point here uh, for me to explain to you or to summarize for you the charge of first degree recklessly endangering safety. Now again, the judge read the law to you all morning and a lot of the afternoon and she's going to read it to you again at the end of the case and you're going to have a binder with all these instructions written down for you so you do not need to memorize them. Okay, But we're going to talk about first degree recklessly endangering safety. It's a crime where it's committed by someone who recklessly endangers the safety of another human being under circumstances that show utter disregard for human life. Let's talk about what the state's not required to prove with recklessly endangering safety. Not required to prove injury. This was a conscious decision in our charging decision. We're not going to get into medical records. We're not going to talk about the details of witnesses' injuries because it's not relevant, except to the extent that it proves that they were uh, endangered and resulted in injury, but we don't need to get into who was hit or how hard or how long they've suffered. We just are going to prove to you that their safety was endangered. So, after Nicole White, we are going to talk, you're going to hear evidence about the first uh, of the larger groups that was affected by this incident, the Waukesha South High School Marching Band. Ten kids in that band got either hit or run over. Here's the first example of our efficient presentation of evidence. You're not going to hear from any one of them. High school-aged kids 
there's video showing each and every one of them getting run over. So instead, you're going to hear from their band director, Sarah Weimar Aparicio. She's going to come in, and she's going to look at some still shots of the video. She's going to identify each of the ten kids for you. You're then going to watch and listen to the video, and it'll be clear as day who's getting run over or hit. It'll be clear as day whose safety was endangered by Mr. Brooks that day. As we move further down the parade route, you'll hear evidence about the Burris Logistics Group. You'll hear uh, testimony from Kelly Grabo about how she was marching with that group along with her young daughter. You'll see video of them. They're dressed up uh, like the Who's from Whoville. You'll see them get hit. As we move further down the parade route, you'll hear testimony about the Green family. They're spectators along the parade route. Charles Green is going to come in and talk about how he was there with his family. He was sitting on the southeast corner of Maine and Gasper across the street from Martha Merrill's books. He'll talk about how his kids were seated on a, a portable bench, something that you bring to a parade to sit on, and how they got knocked off that bench when the defendant ran into them. The next point um, in the presentation of evidence will involve the Waukesha Blazers. I think it's important to point out you can't consider this evidence of each crime in a vacuum. You need to consider the entire incident. Because at this point, by the time we get to the Blazers, the defendant will have already hit or run over 15 people. You'll see in the video that at this point the defendant has actually increased his speed. And you'll hear from Detective Mike Carpenter with the Waukesha Police Department. He's going to come in and talk about speed analysis. He'll tell you that he's certified to use a software program that basically takes surveillance video, measures the amount of time and distance in that video, and calculates an average speed over that distance. And he'll tell you that in video obtained from Bosco Social Club, which is right in front of where the Blazers got hit, he'll tell you that that video in that area right before the Blazers got hit, the defendant was traveling in excess of 33 miles an hour. There were five victims in, in the Blazers. That includes Jackson Sparks, who was watching, walking with his big brother Tucker. Cut down in the road before he had a chance to put any miles on his soul. Jackson was eight. He died two days later in the hospital. I think this is a good point to talk about the law of first degree intentional homicide. Again, the judge provided the law to you. It'll be provided to you again at the conclusion of the trial. I want you to take a look at that second element. I don't know what the defense in this case is going to be. In fact, the defendant isn't required to put one on at all. He can sit there and not say a word throughout this trial, and that's perfectly within his right, and you can't hold that against him. And in fact, if, we, if he does that and we don't prove each and every one of these counts to you beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find him not guilty. That's the law. But if he does choose to present a defense... If he does raise any issues, I expect that he will likely claim that he didn't mean to kill these people. Take a look at that second bullet point. Keep that in mind as you're watching these videos, as you're learning about how this parade unfolded. Consider whether the defendant was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. We're going to move further down the parade route, and the next group after the Blazers is the Extreme Dance Group. There were girls of really all ages in this group, from toddlers being pulled in strollers up to high school-aged teenage dancers. Fifteen victims, fifteen people associated with this group either got hit or were very close to getting hit. That doesn't include two additional spectators who were watching the parade from the south side of Main Street near the Five Points intersection 
right in front of the, of the extreme dance team as the defendant drove through. <coughs> Girls in this dance group suffered catastrophic injuries. The group of victims also includes parents, grandparents, siblings, people marching with the group, but not necessarily as dancers. You're not going to hear from everybody who got hit. You're going to hear from the two instructors, the two young ladies who were tasked with teaching these girls these routines and marching with them and encouraging them and comforting them after the fact. And they're going to, in the video, identify for you where all these girls are positioned, and it'll be very clear the path of travel of the vehicle as it goes through that group of young ladies who was hit and who was nearly hit. The next uh, group down the parade route is Citizens Bank. And here we reach the second count of intentional homicide. Jane Kulik was marching with Citizens Bank with her friends, with her co-workers. This is the only count of homicide for which there is no clear video depicting how she died. So instead of watching video, you're going to hear evidence from her co-worker, and from the man who was driving the truck pulling this float. And they're really the ones who are in the best position to observe exactly what happened to Jane Kulik as the defendant plowed through that parade route. And they're going to describe for you how she was struck, how she was run over. The medical examiner will explain that Jane Kulik's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. We'll move further down southwest along the parade route, and we'll learn about a group that was standing in front of the steaming cup, spectators again. Innocent people have nothing to do with anything. You're going to hear about three kids who were standing, al along with a bunch of others, along the curb in front of steaming cup. And as the defendant swerved from the left side of the street as he hit Jane, back to the right side of the street as he was avoiding the vehicle that was ahead of him, clipped the curb, and hit these three kids. Then we're going to move in to the next group in the parade route, which is the Dancing Grannies. This is the deadliest point in the parade. Seven people in this group were struck. Four of them died. You're going to hear from witnesses, uh, members of the Dancing Grannies group, who will come in and they will describe being completely caught off guard. They will describe seeing pom-poms in the air. And the next thing they knew, there were bodies on the ground before the pom-poms hit the ground. You will learn about Bill Hospel, who was walk marching in a support capacity. He was there to support his wife Lola and their friends, the rest of the dancing grannies, just walking along the parade route trying to be helpful. And as the defendant swerved around the dancing grannies vehicle, which is a white SUV, you'll see it in the video, swerved around the right side, he hits Bill, and the medical examiner is going to tell you that Bill Hospital caused the death with multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll learn about Tamara Durand, marching with the grannies. This is her first parade. You'll see a diagram of where she was positioned. You'll see video of her getting struck. The medical examiner will tell you that Tamara Durand caused a death, multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear about Lee Owen, another dancing granny, Positioned right next to Lee, excuse me, right next to Tamara, who had just begun one of her favorite routines, walking in a winter wonderland, when she got hit. You'll learn about Jenny Sorensen. You'll learn that Jenny was walking at the front of the group carrying the banner. You'll learn that Jenny was normally a coach for the group. Normally she rode in the vehicle in the back so that she could provide feedback and critique 
to her dance mates. But she filled in at the last moment today and helped carry the banner. You'll see video of Jenny getting struck. Medical examiner will tell you that Jenny Sorensen's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear more speed analysis, test analysis testimony at this point. You're going to hear from Mike Smith with the Wisconsin State Patrol, who's going to testify very similarly to how Detective Carpenter is going to testify about speed analysis. Basically, he takes surveillance video, this time from Curry Insurance, which is on the south side of Main Street. It shows the grannies getting struck. They measure point to point and <coughs> measure the time between those two points and calculate an average speed over that distance, which is roughly from Clinton Street up until the camera cuts out. I'll tell you that at that point, where the defendant crashed through the Dancing Grannies group, he was traveling at approximately 32 miles an hour. The eighth and final group that was struck by the defendant in this case is the Catholic Communities of Waukesha. This is a faith-based organization. It consists of members of multiple local Catholic churches who got together that Sunday afternoon to spread a little Christmas cheer. There is not great video, and perhaps that's for the best, of this group getting struck. In total, there were 19 victims in this group. In what little you can see from the video, you can see the defendant's taillights swerving from the left side of the street to the right. You can see them bouncing up and down. There are no speed bumps in that section of the road. The next phase of the evidence will involve uh, the manhunt. How authorities found the defendant, took him into custody, and the statements he made after he was placed under arrest. You will hear from Officer Bryce Skolton, who was positioned, if you look at this third of the three maps I referenced, uh, on the very top of this map, at the intersection of Main Street and Wisconsin. Officer Skolton was positioned at that point to direct the parade route to make a left-hand turn from Main Street onto Wisconsin, to stop any traffic coming from the other directions. He saw the defendant come around that corner. He saw the defendant drive right at him as he's standing in the middle of the road. And as the defendant went around him to the left, and went south, Officer Skolton fired three rounds from his service weapon. All three rounds hit the car. None of them hit the defendant. You will hear from uh, another police officer who was not on duty that day. He just happens to be a police officer. His name is Officer Ralph Salyers. He's from the Wauwatosa Police Department. If you take a look at that map, he's going to describe to you being uh, on the sidewalk, leaving the parade. He was walking past... Les Paul Middle School. He's going to describe hearing a loud commotion. He's going to describe <laughs> seeing a red SUV with just utterly total front end damage coming to rest uh, in a driveway at 338 Maple Avenue. You're going to see video of the defendant in the red SUV pulling into the alley behind 338 Maple and then a few moments later, you'll see what appears to be the defendant coming back onto the screen and running away from the vehicle, apparently in a hurry, apparently aware that he had done something terribly wrong. You're going to hear from a series of witnesses between that point and the defendant's arrest where they will describe the defendant approaching them, contacting them, asking them to use their phone. Because he was in such a rush when he ditched his SUV, he left his phones behind. Then you're going to hear from Daniel Ryder, and I think the evidence will show Daniel Ryder really is a good embodiment of the spirit of Waukesha. Not knowing what Mr. Brooks had done, Daniel Ryder opened his home to the defendant. The defendant showed up at his front door without any shoes on, with a t-shirt, said he was cold, said he needed to use the phone. Daniel Ryder let him inside. Gave him a sandwich, let him use the phone, and then gave him a coat. 
And a few minutes later, the police showed up. You're going to see body cam video of that arrest. You're going to hear from Officer Rebecca Carpenter that she responded to that area around where Daniel Ryder lives because of reports of a man knocking on doors. She takes him into custody. He identifies himself on the body cam video. They search him. And in his pocket, they find a red, excuse me, a key to the red Ford Escape used in this attack. You're going to hear from a series of officers who retraced the defendant's steps that night, recovered surveillance video showing the path that he took, the path that's depicted here in the third map that I'm showing you. You're going to hear how they recovered his sandal, his sweatshirt, along the, the escape route. You're going to hear from Detective Jay Carpenter with the City of Waukesha Police Department, and he's going to talk to you about the defendant's statements after he was taken into custody. I'm going to let that interview speak for itself, other than pointing out for you that you will, I think, quickly learn a few main points about the defendant on the night that this happened. He was lucid. He was aware. He was intelligent. He was probing for information. And he was deceptive. We're going to then wrap up with testimony from people who plugged any of the remaining holes in the investigation. You'll hear from crime lab analysts, about DNA evidence, about finding the defendant's DNA on the steering wheel of the Red Ford Escape. You're going to hear from Wisconsin State Patrol Inspector Ryan Schultz. He's going to testify about the mechanical inspection that he did on this vehicle. In case you were wondering if there were any issues that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping or from pulling over, he's going to quickly put those concerns to bed. He conducted that mechanical inspection no problem with the brakes. The accelerator didn't stick. There were no mechanical problems that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping. Finally, we're going to close our presentation of the evidence, not with a witness, but with an experience for you. You are going to go to a secure location, and you're going to have a chance to see the murder weapon with your own eyes. You'll be able to see that red Ford escape. I want to close now with a few points about how the evidence relates to the law in this case. There are, obviously, we've gone through the six counts of first-degree intentional homicide. But in addition to those homicide counts, there are six counts of hit-and-run involving death. Those are separate charges. The evidence will support convictions on all of them, all 12 counts of homicide. But they involve the same six victims. Another point I want to bring to your attention is that for each count of first-degree intentional homicide and each count of first-degree recklessly endangering safety, if you find the defendant guilty of any of those counts, you have to answer a second question. Did he commit that crime while using a dangerous weapon? And here the evidence will show that he didn't use a gun or a knife to commit these crimes. He used 3,500 pounds of steel, rubber, and glass. The defendant's also charged with two counts of felony bail jumping. You'll hear evidence uh, to support those charges, which includes the fact that the defendant was charged with a felony offense in a case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And then he was charged with another felony offense in a separate case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And those conditions of bail included requirements that he not commit any new crime. And those conditions of bail were in effect on November 21st of 2021. We have dozens of video clips to show you. You're going to have notebooks and writing utensils while we present this evidence to you. It's a lot to keep track of. And when you go back into the deliberation room, it might be difficult while you're deliberating to remember which video was about which victim, or which incident, or which group. And so my suggestion to you is that as we go through these videos, you're free to do whatever you want with your notes, but my suggestion would be as we go through these videos, they each will be labeled with an exhibit number, and so I recommend that you keep track of which exhibit number corresponds with which video. That way, while you're deliberating, if you want to see those videos again, you can ask for them by exhibit number. 
Can't guarantee that you'll be able to see any or all of them, but you can ask. I'm done now. I want to close on one final point, and that is, on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, I want to say thank you. We work your serving in what is the greatest criminal justice system in the history of the world, and that's because of the 16 of you. It's because a group of citizens, randomly selected, come in and make the final, ultimate determination between guilty and not guilty. That's unique in this world. It's special. And so, we're going to go through this evidence. We're going to be mindful of your time. We know how valuable it is. We're going to be efficient. But we have a lot to get through. A lot. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, District Attorney Opper is going to stand up here and she's going to ask you to render verdicts consistent with the evidence. To find the defendant guilty of each and every count. Thank you. Mr. Brooks, my first question to you is, will you be making an opening statement at this point or deferring until your case, maybe the defense portion of the case? Uh, I will be deferring at this time, Your Honor. I need uh, a little more adequate time to make sure I go over the points that I need to make. All right, then the court will... Uh, Honor that request, advise the jury he's deferring his opening statement until a later point in the proceedings.